Welcome to a fun evening of FinTech lined up for you. As you guys saw, I'm Leal Al Hadi, the Executive Director of FinTech Cadence. I also have the pleasure of being your MC for today. So make sure you guys get comfortable, sit back, grab a drink. We're ready to listen to some phenomenal pitches on cybersecurity and to meet five FinTechs that are helping Canadians and businesses tackle cyber threats. We have a full evening planned for you guys. We're going to be giving you guys a little bit of context about what's been going on. Hopefully you've been hearing about this for a few weeks now. And so we'd love to give you a little bit of a history, a little bit of a background of some of the experiences that the startups have gone through. Followed by that, we're going to be listening to startup pitches, which is why we imagine all of you guys are here with us today. As I mentioned, we have five startups that are going to be competing tonight. Uh, they're all doing some phenomenal work in the cybersecurity space. So you'll have a chance to hear from them directly and hear about the products and the businesses that they are building. Following their pitches, we're gonna be doing some deliberation, but for our audience, we do have a special fireside chat hosted by our very own Elvis Wong, where we'll be having Michel Genot Katsuya join him so that he can talk a little bit about his experiences in cybersecurity. And we're excited to bring him on. He's an expert, an author, a commentator surrounding threat and security assessments. He has 40 years of services and he's worked with the RCMP and the Canadian Securities Intelligence Services. So they have a great conversation lined up for you. Following our fireside chat, we're gonna be going straight into the winner's announcements. We have some really cool prizes to announce and we'll be doing that shortly to let you guys know what these startups are pitching for. 
And lastly, unfortunately, everything does eventually have to come to an end. So we'll do a quick wrap up, but we'll also be giving you guys the opportunity to network with each other. We have quite a few people here today. And so we thought it would be a wonderful way, even though we're virtual, to still give you some kind of a real life experience by connecting you guys in the networking component later on. So we're going to get into it. But before I do, I also want to let you guys know that the chat is active. I know some of you are already posting on there. We also have FinTech Cadence team engaging with you. We have Marina, Elvis, Molly, Nina. So make sure you guys connect with them. Um, say hello on the chat. Tell us where you guys are here listening from. And we'd love to see who's here tonight with us. As I mentioned earlier on, this whole experience, this whole cybersecurity focus is an initiative by Desjardins. It's powered by startup and residents, and of course, we're supporting them in the whole process. But it's really key for the fintech ecosystem across Canada to have these little touch points throughout the year, especially focused on different verticals, so that we can give these startups awareness, we can give them visibility, we can give them industry expertise, and of course, as always, be able to give them a little bit of access to capital as well. And so we're very happy. And on behalf of Desjardins Startup in Residence and Fintech Cadence, we're really excited to be able to present you with tonight's event. For those of you who don't know who Fintech Cadence is, you will allow me a five second pitch just to explain what our organization does. We are a nonprofit organization based here in Montreal, but we do operate all of our services and our programs across Canada. And our main focus is to develop Canada's future fintech leaders. We do three main things. And the first thing is education around anything fintech. So if you are interested in fintech, if you are interested in learning more about the space, or if you are experienced in fintech and you want to contribute, then please connect with us. We do have a certificate coming up, uh, so keep your eye on that. The second thing that we do is we support early stage fintech startups. We support them through industry expertise, through mentorship, through business model validation. We run the whole gambit. And so if you are a startup that's looking for support, or if you know a startup needs support, please do connect them to us and we'll be happy to support them throughout their journey. And last but not least, but very fruitful for what we're here today, we collaborate directly with financial institutions. Our main ethos at FinTech Cadence is to be able to connect all stakeholders together in order to ensure a really robust and sustainable FinTech ecosystem in Canada. And part of that and part of our role with that is to understand the needs and requirements and interests of the financial institutions to be able to help connect them to our startup community and to the talent that we work with as well. So very simply, we educate, we support, and we collaborate. If you want to know more about us, please feel free to check out our website. Our link should be in the chat right now. Connect with any of us on LinkedIn and make sure to follow us on social media so that you can hear more about the events that are coming up in the fintech space. Next, I want to thank our community partners. As we mentioned, the focus of this uh, the finals tonight is to connect with startups from across Canada, and that would not have been possible without the support of our community partners. So I would like to thank the DMZ, Atlantic Fintech, Spring, New Ventures BC, Cyber Echo, as well as the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst. They've all been really instrumental in helping us connect, recruit startups, to connect us with industry experts, as well as get the word of mouth out there for the events that have been going on aligned to what we're going to align to. The, the cybersecurity focus through this challenge. I did mention we wanted to give you a little bit of context as to what the startups have been going through. So of course, you guys are going to hear the startups tonight, but it's also really key that you know what they've been doing behind the scenes and what the, what the, the lineup of startups has looked like. So just a very quick high level stats for you guys. We did have a call for applications earlier on. We had a number of teams apply. We, from those teams, we were lucky to select 16 teams specifically, and they were representative of four different Canadian provinces, British Columbia, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Quebec. Now, I know I've mentioned this a couple of times. There are five startups that are pitching tonight, but the 16 startups that went through this whole process are incredibly exciting startups. And for those of you who are interested in fintech, who are interested in the cybersecurity space, we highly encourage you to look and check out the other 11 startups that you will not be hearing from today. We do think they're doing some really innovative things in the space, and we'll be sharing a link on the chat as well for more information on how you can find out about these startups. Remember, the things that startups are really looking for is network, industry expertise and support, connections to financial institutions, and of course, connections to capital. So if you can provide any of those components, or if you know anyone who can, please make sure to check out those startups and reach out to them directly. 
and be able to give them a little bit of support as they go and develop into their products and their businesses. And from these 16 startups, as we've said, we've selected five. So the five startups that you guys are going to be listening to today include Faith, Cyber Defense AI, SciDef, Kinetics, and B Data. They'll be coming in shortly to pitch, but these are the five startups that we have been excited to pick through in the process um, from the 16 startups that were introduced a short while ago. So what is the process that they've gone through? Well, they did start off with sessions on pitching. They were also had sessions on investments and the way the right way to do investments, as well as tech development, back end and front end product development as well. Following that, they had a private semifinals uh, done where they were selected throughout it. And then they entered phase two, of which in this phase, they were connected to industry experts in cybersecurity who did a stress test on their product development, their validation, their business model, their investment strategies, and their overall team makeup. And so they've really gone through quite amount of sessions and quite amount of development to get them to where they are. And that's not to speak of all the work that they've been doing by themselves as they've built their businesses. We're now here with them in the finals. And what we expect once they're done, those who are selected in the top three, two of which will be in, entered into the startup and residence program out of Desjardins, and one will be selected to enter the FinTech Cadence program. So quite an exciting journey, quite a lot of work that's been done in the back end, and let's see what they're going to be actually competing for today. First thing is first place prize. The first place prize is a $25,000 cash non-dilutive prize followed by an admission to startup in residence program. And what's really interesting and really exciting is there's also a potential investment of up to $250,000. So we often in FinTech Cadence talk about the need to be able to support early stage startups with capital. This is a wonderful initiative by a startup in residence in Desjardins team where they're giving a potential investment there as well. So very exciting first place prize. The second place prize, equally as exciting, followed by a $15,000 non-dilutive cash prize, admission into startup and residence program and the potential investment of $250,000. And last but not least, the third place prize wins a $5,000 non-dilutive cash prize and admission into FinTech Cadence's support program. So all very exciting stuff. You can see why they've been working really, really hard in this in the, over the last few weeks. Um, and now I'd love to introduce you to the judges that are going to be deliberating on who wins these prizes. We're lucky to have representatives from the following organizations, Desjardins, Roger Cybersecure Catalyst, Luge Capital, as well as the startup in residence team. And more specifically, I'd love to introduce you to the judges one by one. Our first is Paulin Chanteroux, who is a Senior Director of Cybersecurity Strategy and Transformation out of Desjardins. We have Thomas Gagné, who is the Director of Corporate Development of FinTech at Desjardins. Laviva Mazhar, who is an Investment Associate out of Luge Capital. Mehdi Bakhti, who is a Business Expert Advisor of Innovation and Technologies for Desjardins. Eric Balduc, who is an Investment Manager at Venture Capital for Desjardins Capital. Sumit Batai, who is a Director for Innovation and Policy at Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst for Ryerson University and also a partner for us throughout this process. And last but not least, we have Sarah Bizou gervais who is a Senior Advisor for Open Innovation out of the Startup in Residence out of Desjardins. So you can see we have a full line of judges ready tonight to listen to the pitches, ready to listen to the teams, and I do not envy their job of selecting the top three teams out of these five. But without further ado, I hope you guys are relaxed. I hope the teams are ready to go. Like I said, make sure you're still speaking to us on the chat. Let us know what you guys are thinking of the teams. Let us know what you're thinking of the pitches. Um, and without further ado, I think it's now time to meet our five finalists. We're going to be starting off with Faith. So I'm going to be introducing the co-founder and CEO, Jonathan Gagné. Hi, my name is Jonathan Gagne. I'm CEO founder of Faith. I'm with my partner, Samuel Lemay. We are friends since over 25 years. He's the chief commercial officer and the co-founder of Faith. 
Me and Samuel tackle, join our force together in order to tackle one of the biggest problems, cyber crimes. Cyber crime is now the largest criminal industry that the hurt ever saw. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse and we're losing the battle. So that's why me and Samuel was trying to find a solution to it. And we have been surprised. There's a ton of solution. There's a multi-factor authentication with the face recognition, with the fingerprinting, QR code, SMS, email that you link on. But I don't know if you're like me and Samuel, we are not fan of them. We don't like to use them, even if we're working into the cybersecurity industry. Based on Microsoft, there is only a poor adoption rate of 11% of the multi-factor authentication. This is the problem. That problem costs organization every year $6 trillion. So that's why me and Samuel tried to find a solution, not another MFA that the people won't use, but a real solution where the people will like to use. And we found it. We create a behavior biometric based cybersecurity technology. It's a multi-factor identification that we embed behind the sign. That's allow organization to enforce a 100% adoption rate, which solves the problem. It's totally frictionless. The user doesn't see anything, doesn't have to make any training, and is still protected. The beauty of it is this is continuous. So that means it's not only acting during the authentication, but it's acting during the whole session, such as an example. If an employee is going to grab a coffee without logging off the computer, and another employee tried to use the computer, as soon as you will type on the keyboard, as soon as you will move the, the mouse, we're going to see that it doesn't have the same behavior biometry, and we're going to log off that user. Another example, with the trending of remote working, a lot of employees put their password over a post-it and put the post-it over their screen. But if there is a frustrated teenager or a jealous husband who put the hand on it, they can log in as an employee and the employer doesn't see anything. So that's why Faith assured that this is the right behavior biometric in order that only employee can access the corporate information. The way that's work is we're monitoring the human direction with their mouse, keyboard, and touch screen. Then we're collecting thousands of patterns, such as click length, mouse speed, uh, acceleration, disacceleration, typing cadence. And then we are using machine learning in order to create the behavior profile that's going to authenticate the user to all this session. The project can be embedded in web application, mobile application, and workstation. When the third party is made a call, we're returning the information of the based on authenticity, the danger of web bot, insider threat, external actor, and blacklisting. And then we let the third party decide what he would like to do with the information we provide him. We have a business model based on the mon monthly employee fee. More employee you have, less expensive it would be. Our price range is between $1 to $17. We have a team of over 35 employees. Very, very talented. Just by example, Daniel Steve, our CIO, and Andrew Stewart, our CISO, have over 40 years of experience into the national defense into the cybersecurity department. We are already partnered with IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon, and as well, we're partnered with the integrator Octo and Zoo. We already have two paying customers into the credit union industry and the cybersecurity consulting company. We have obviously a lot of traction from the national defense, from the video gaming industry, China, Korea, EA Games, from Canada of New Agency, Samsung, and so on. But in order to don't get spread all around, we decide to centralize our report into the vertical of the FinTech, which is the bank, credit union, and financial platform with their integrator. We already create our MVP and a great partnership. We are secure our financing for the next coming months, and we finish the pilot and the demo with Technicus and Brad and Rollins. We are now coming to FinTech Cadence and Startup and Residence of Desjardins in order to receive help, in order to make our industry validation and the seed round opening in February 2022. I hope you like to hear about Faith because me, it was a real pleasure to talk about our multi-factor authentication without any complication. Thank you. Amazing. Well done, Jonathan. I'm going to give you a round of applause on behalf of all of the audience. I'm also going to pull up Samuel Lemay, who is the co-founder and CCO of Faith. Welcome, Samuel. We do have some questions from the judges, so I'm going to bring on Laviva from Luge Capital. Hi, Jonathan and Samuel. Great to see you guys here, and thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is around your sales positioning to your potential customers. Um, compared to, you know, some of the competitors that exist in the market, how do you position the solution kind of differently and what would 
let you win those customers over some of the competitors that exist? So we build a solution, Laviva, to in order to be able to embed in any IAM system already existing out there. So how the other competitors you might compare to us or all the identity and access management service provider on which we want to be layered within the fabric of the ensemble of tools that they offer already to their clients. So obviously that would be just amazing to be able to work directly with corporations and banks like Desjardins. And that's the goal and that's why we're here for. But obviously we don't see our competitors as uh, real competitors. We just want to be allowing clients to have more visibility and have more techniques in order to prevent fraud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laviva, for the question. I'm going to bring on Mehdi from Desjardins. Bonjour, messieurs. Um, question de question de geek parce que parce que ça me ça, ça me chicote. En tant, en tant que geek qui, euh, qui a aucun stress avec le biometrics, face euh, euh, fingerprint recognition. Um, question sous question. Um, je comprends que vous aimez pas. Je comprends que l'adoption rate est plus faible. Um, Comment est-ce que vous êtes capable d'expliquer ça à des, des, des huge corps qu'on va avoir plusieurs, plusieurs métriques différentes que le fait que la personne change d'ordinateur ou de souris ou de, euh, de façon d'opérer ces trucs, ça ne va pas euh, biaiser les résultats. Euh, puis deux, justement, puisque les cellulaires se retrouvent un petit peu partout, comment est-ce que vous, euh, vous opérez à travers des applications mobiles ou à travers l'utilisation qui est de plus, euh, de plus en plus... Euh, um, complète et totale des, 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 des appareils mobiles. Je me tais, je vous laisse parler. Donc, c'était une longue question. Merci, Mehdi. <rire> en fait, euh, au niveau des métriques, on agit vraiment sur des, euh, des points de contrôle qui sont dans le subconscient des, des utilisateurs. Donc, c'est un phénomène, c'est une technique qui est difficile à expliquer, qui est difficile à comprendre. À la base, tu n'es pas le seul là, qui ne comprend pas comment on réussit ça. Et c'est euh, les capacités du machine learning et puis du AI qui vont nous permettre d'aller chercher ces points de données-là qui sont incompréhensibles pour l'humain, mais que la machine va être capable de traiter et va être capable d'ajouter dans les différentes techniques, euh, dans les différentes techniques pour le traitement de, de ce multi-factor authentication là. Jonathan, je ne sais pas si tu voulais ajouter quelque chose de très spécifique parce que la question était Totalement. une question geek qui a été annoncée, donc je te laisse prendre le, le relais. Bien, les corporations viennent nous voir parce que présentement leurs employés ils font des plaintes comme quoi qu'ils n'aiment pas les multifacteurs d'application qu'ils utilisent avec le téléphone des fois ils n'aiment pas utiliser le téléphone des fois ils n'aiment pas utiliser tout le temps le email click des fois ils n'aiment pas le QR code des fois il y a du monde qui n'aime pas tout simplement quand ils n'ont plus l'accès au satellite ils peuvent plus faire l'authentification et recevoir le pin code donc nous quand on arrive on dit il n'y a aucune aucune friction il n'y a aucun training il n'y a aucune complication Lorsque la personne change d'ordinateur, souvent, elle va avoir la même biométrie, la même accélération, la même désaccélération, et nos machine learning sont capables de faire du scaling sur les models. Mais en même temps, si la personne se brise un doigt, s'il change un, un appareil ou un device qui est vraiment très, très flagrant, qui va changer la, la biévia biométrique, à partir de là, c'est le seul moment où ce qu'on va faire une troisième step verification pour ajouter le nouveau biométrie à l'ancien biométrie et maintenant accepter les deux. Merci. De rien. Thank you very much, Jonathan and Samuel. Mehdi, thank you very much for the question. Really appreciate it. Well done again to Team Faith for your pitch, for the Q&A. Good luck with the rest of the process. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. So just a quick reminder for those of you who are engaging on the chat and being told that there's quite a lot of activity happening. That's wonderful. I do want to let you guys know that if you see any startup on here that you really were engaged by, interested by, or want to support, then I'll highly encourage you to either connect to Jonathan or Samuel or any of the other founders that come on after on LinkedIn. They always appreciate support as well. Check out their website for even more information. And if you or somebody else you know um, can support them in any way. Remember, network, mentorship, industry access, capital, those are the things our startup needs. So make sure you're able to, to do that and connect with them to help support them throughout their process. With that being said, I would love to introduce Michael Nadeau, the next 
founder, who's co-founder and CTO of cyberdefense.ai. Hey guys, uh, I'm Michael. Uh, Michael Nado, I'm CTO and co-founder of Cyber Defense AI. Um, our small startup from Montreal um, is here. So I previously worked at Godad in Sucury, where I met our co-founder Michel Bourque, uh, which was involved in OAS Montreal and also one of the best uh, ad hunter in the city. And together we were able uh, to combine the perfect team of developers, analysts, and security specialists. Uh, and by following the guidelines of OpenExo, we were able to bring some nice partners like Explore AI and Mental Blockchain, which help us go faster into development and brings along uh, some nice technologies to solve one issues. The fact that ACMEs right now are not able to defend themselves against threats like ransomware because they don't have the resources to do so. And professionals from the industry like Gartner and Forrester would agree that it's time for an age of automation and integration because security experts expertise is getting out of reach from SMEs. There's too many confusing solutions to integrate together on the market uh, and regulations are just getting heavier and heavier with things like Law 64 in Quebec that will force those SMEs, you know, to get a decent infrastructure in terms of cloud uh, to protect themselves, monitor what's happening you know, and, and to be able to get some basic certification. Uh, and we all know that this has a cost that those SMEs cannot really afford in most situation. So our team designed a solution which runs on the platform as a service, but we call it internally a cloud infrastructure as a service, meaning that you get all you need from the cloud uh, in terms of protection, monitoring, uh, and optimization. And it also includes machine learning to allow us you know, to detect bad behavior and anomalies within the traffic. All of this is possible within Fuclex. It starts at 10 bucks per month. You don't need a PhD to operate it. If you don't know how to do it, it will set up by itself and gives you, you know, the, the best recommendation uh, and the benefits of using our cloud infrastructure gives you a better reputation online because you don't have to deal with defacing spam and, and malwares like ransomware. You get an easy compliance to sell online if you need to. Uh, you have a maintenance free infrastructure, so you don't have to hire people to do so. And we're going to scale with you because we're designed to do so. It means that if you grow, we'll grow with you, basically. And, and it brings us to the market, which is even, is even more interesting because we have a huge opportunity with hosting provider, solution provider, and cloud provider that can integrate our solutions to provide exactly the same things in few clicks to their clients. But it's even more interesting for self host organization that don't want to do the big switch to go into the cloud. They can just connect their existing infrastructure to us, and we will be their open doors in the cloud. Uh, in the past 18 months, uh, we were going from the, the proof of concept through our own bootstrap with Prompt uh, to Alpha and Beta with Zonti and Mental. And we're expecting to reach the market by the end of the year. We're still on track for next year for a few millions in revenue. Uh, and we already have 100 clients signed up on the platform. And in the long run, we're applying to integrate gamification to help with cyber insurance. We're coming along with blockchain for enterprise client. We want to go all in for certification. And uh, late here, uh, late later uh, down the line, we're having some BIM project in the construction. And we're planning to be one of the first technology to be fully SASE ready uh, and to integrate basically a social cloud, meaning that we can do we can offer the same services we do for web services, but for any services running in the cloud. So next time that you have to deal with going online, will you be with us? Amazing. Well done, Michael. I'm going to give you as well a round of applause from on behalf of the audience. And I'm also going to open it up to our judges for questions. We do have a question from Eric Balduk, so I'll bring him up on the stage. Yeah, hi, Michael. I would like to know more about your plans. You talked about $10 per month. It's based on what and to which extent. Uh, I saw also in, in, in your video that it could go up to $25 a month. So if you give, give, can give us uh, more insight on this. 
Yeah, basically the 10 bucks per month means all the minimum that you need, let's say to host your website online, to protect it, make sure that, you know, you don't have issue with it. Uh, and the more you grow, the pricing will go with it in terms of you need to sell online, if you need to have more, you know, more level of certification or more monitoring to make sure like, you know, if you're selling online for, uh, let's say for a few millions per day or per month, you don't want to have a week that your website is down and that you're lacking monitoring. You don't know what's happening. You want to have more instant services. So to do so, we created multiple tier that will fit different segment of SMEs that, you know, would use our services. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Eric, for the question. I'm going to bring on Sumit. Sumit, do you have a question as well? Uh, thanks, Lael. Michael, great presentation. Okay. Um, thanks. I wanted to know a little bit about your core target audience. Uh, who within the spectrum are you really targeting? And when you talk about that 100 clients that you onboarded already, are these uh, paid clients, are they POCs, and are they part of your core target audience group? Uh, I would say it's a mix of all of this. Uh, we have a few clients that are, I mean, for now, we're giving away the beta uh, to make it uh, all out there. Uh, and yes, we have paying clients that are already there testing. We have POC clients that are still there. There's a lot of them that were there just to try it out, I would say. Uh, so it's really a mix of all those answers. Uh, and to be, uh, to be really frank with you, we're still, you know, in beta phase, uh, as you may know. And we don't actually have the perfect metrics to tell you exactly. Like we have targets on, you know, we have partners trying it out. We have, like I said, some ready to pay customer, but it's not, we don't have metric at the moment to tell you exactly how much of each. That's our next step. Thanks, Michael. Perfect. Thank you, Sumit, so much for the question. Michael, I have a question here from you from Sarah from Startup in Residence, and that is, what differentiates you from other one-click deploy apps and images available on various cloud marketplaces? Oh, it's quite a bit different, though, because when you deploy a one-click app on the cloud, it means you deploy something like a WordPress, you know, to host your website. But in our case, it's all the things that goes on top of, you know, being uh, having a server running in the cloud is the fact that you have the protection, you have the scaling capabilities of handling bigger traffics, and you don't have to deal with all the other components, you know, to survey, uh, you know, th what's happening really with your uh, with your server. Uh, that's the big difference is the fact that it's two things that goes together. You need both to go online. It's not only you pay for a server and it's all magical. It's all happening for you. You need to have both basically to make it happen if you want to scale your business. Okay, that's wonderful, Michael. Thank you very much for that response. I'm going to bring on um, Paula from Desjardins with a question. Hi, Michael. Nice. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you presented a, f a few actual or future products. What will be the main products you will focus on? Because you talk about a lot of solutions in your platform. Uh, it's the fact that the goal of our, of our platform basically is the end target is really the SASE market, meaning that, you go, we, you know, uh, at the second you think about going online, you know, for now we're focused really on what's happening in the web, meaning your website, your eShop, or any web services that you could be running, could be a mail server, it could be any types of application, it could be an API. Uh, we can protect it, but in the future, when we, what we really want to do is being able to take our technology, move it another step, to be able to support any kind of services that will run online. So it can include things like uh, the, um, the the new things for the city. I don't remember the terms, like the, the numeric cities like that will interconnect on the cloud and 5G. We have construction coming along. There, there's a lot of project that want to use our technology basically uh, to make their dreams come true. Uh, and we're really willing you know, to go past only supporting the web, but our first target is mainly our audience will be the web, uh, to be honest with you. Like we really want to be able to mm -hmm. smash that target before going somewhere else. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Pona, for the question. Thank you to Sumit, Eric, and Sarah as well. Michael, all done. You can relax now. Good luck with the rest of the process and we'll be seeing you hopefully soon. Thank you. All right, guys, two teams down, three more to go. Our next team up we have is SciDef, and I'm going to be inviting the COO, Ilana Graham, up to the stage. Thanks, 
very much, everybody. We're SciDef, and we defend small and medium-sized businesses against cyber attacks. We do it efficiently, with less time and less money spent. We mitigate a major organizational risk, the one that keeps leaders up at night, wondering if they are sufficiently protected. We've all seen the news headlines. Ransomware is on the rise. It is big business. Who are they targeting? 70% of attacks target small and medium-sized businesses. Why? Because we know that AV alone does not protect against all attacks. Threats can still snake their way through those protection layers. Your home is a perfect analogy for cybersecurity. Your windows and doors have locks to keep criminals out. And those are the protection layer tools, antivirus, spam filter, firewall. But how will you know if a criminal has evaded those defenses? You need video cameras to see what's happening inside. That is detection and response. And sadly, that is what many SMBs don't have. And why, yes, there are enterprise-grade detection and response solutions out there. They have lots of cyber experts on staff who focus on new criminal attack pathways, leveraging AI to intercept them. And typically, this results in some false positives or false negatives, depending on how the rules are applied. So with 40,000 new attacks a day, this translates into technology that is complex to operate and maintain. It requires cybersecurity experts, usually outsourced, which leads to a lot of money and time that SMBs take away from their core business activities. Our story starts here. Our team was frustrated with the time, effort, and cost of using these traditional tools. And our founding members, with 57 years of combined cyber expertise, yes, I counted, including two PhDs, we were absolutely convinced we could simplify the monitoring process, leveraging affordable cloud technology. And we chose to flip the security model around because at SciDef, we do not put our faith in criminals. We put our trust in math. We focus on classifying the good behavior, specifically application and process behavior analytics. It's a smaller list to maintain. Classifying good behavior on endpoints means that whatever is left over is new anomalous activity and it gets investigated right away. And that makes SciDef's security model a zero trust model. And we've wrapped that our technology as a managed detection and response service. And we call it Smart Monitor. It's easy to implement. It's a quick install of a light agent to collect key telemetry, no personally identifiable information. It means minimal ramp up period and there is no painful ongoing fine tuning. It's turnkey. It delivers meaningful alerts, not hundreds of false positives that still need to be investigated. And the end result is a more efficient and effective solution. In fact, when you consider the ratio of analysts to devices monitored, we are five times more efficient. Our customers who have chosen us over the big hitters tell us we're more reliable. And we are saving those same customers over 80% in overhead costs because their IT team does not need to monitor or maintain complex technology. And these are just a few of the meaningful alerts we provide our customers. We notify for things like policy violations. We're seeing a lot of crypto mining installations these days, right through to malware, ransomware, and espionage. 40% of our customers' protection layer tools were breached with malware attacks, usually through a phishing email. But with Smart Monitor as their eyes and ears to detect and respond, their return on investment is literally in the millions of dollars. A quick glance at our accomplishments to date, we recently completed a third-party validation of our technology with the amazing folks at SendGen. We confirmed the scalability to 1 million devices without breaking a sweat. Our client success to date, actually 86 organizations monitored, and we're able to convert 90% of those organizations who take our free trial. I'm really proud of this one. We have 0% churn right now. We're just cresting up to 50,000 monthly recurring revenue. And our managed services, MSRP, is $10 per device per month. That's managed service, not just the tech. Our primary channel is through managed service providers and security service providers. But we knew we had to build our reputation going B2B. And we like to think we're industry agnostic. And our current clients include law enforcement, education, banking, medical, pharmacies, and defense contractors. So the total addressable market for us is Blue Ocean SMB. According to Gartner, that's a $170 billion market opportunity. For the investors in the room, we're in our, our next round of funding, targeting 5 million Canadian to expand our sales and marketing team. 
I did have to sneak a picture in of our board of directors, accomplished Canadians who believe as we do that everyone needs to be safe to do business online. And that includes the SMB customers of major banking and insurance institutions. Thanks very much. Well done, well, Elena. Well. I'm gonna give you a round of applause as well on behalf of all the audience listening. And I'm also gonna bring up to the stage, Steve Rainville, who is the CEO and will be joining you for the Q&A portion. We have a few questions. Hi, Steve, how are you? Good, thank you. Perfect. I'm gonna start off with Paulin from Desjardins who has his first question. Hi, Helena. Hi, Steve. Um, as you said, there is a lot of big competitors on the domain of EDR and MDR solutions. What is your key differentiator and do you have the ambition to replace them or to work with them on the endpoint? Great question. Um, I think there's there's room for everyone. And, you know, there, there's charts out there that shows, you know, all of the different competitors and it's probably close to 100 uh, that work in the space. Uh, but let's think about this. There's in Canada, at least a million small businesses. And there's only a fraction of those that are served today by any type of solution, whether that's EDR or MDR. And so for us, it's really about, we have a different approach. And, you know, so far, so good. We're showing that the approach is viable. It um, it performs well and it produces the results. And we are sharing this. The, the other part of this is that we're not, It's it, there's no dark art in this. And we're all the, in this together, right? We, cyber crime, cy cyber risk, we need to bring that under control. And everyone that can help is just good for the economy. It's good for our businesses, good for Canada, right? And and we need, we need help. So we're just another option uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Paula, for the question. I'm going to bring on Thomas from Desjardins next. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for the, your presentation, uh, Helena, and hi, Steve. Um, yeah, the market uh, seems very big with one more, one million SMB. What is your strategy uh, to, to reach the, uh, the, the enterprise and sell your product? And do, do you have right now a corporate development person to, to develop uh, your, your, your market? We brought on, um, thanks for the question, and we, we have brought on uh, a chief revenue officer and working with our team, working with, with Ilana and myself to go to market, right? And as Ilana was mentioning, looking at uh, more partnerships with service providers, whether they are in, in IT and they want to provide additional capabilities with cyber, uh, looking at service uh, providers that MSSPs specialize in cybersecurity. Uh, because as every as we all probably know, there aren't enough resources to go around. So we can help all of those organizations uh, provide the protection that their customers are requesting through our services, right? It's just another part of the portfolio. And the strategy here is, again, trials, prove it out, confirm, and, and we call them proof of values, and then work with those partners to say, instead of converting and we are doing direct you know business to business sales but obviously if we work with uh, partners or service providers that have 50 or 100 customers well our objective obviously is to grow that partnership and convert and onboard all of those uh, customers and then we we work through that and grow the the channel and and our, our base customers that way thank you Steve. perfect thank you very much thomas for the question eric i'm going to come to you next Yes, thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering, your 85 uh, current customers, uh, were they through the uh, SMB channel or through the uh, EDR channel or uh, were they direct? Uh, and how long did you, uh, for how long did they try your solution so far? Great question. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we have some customers that have started as, uh, I qualify them as friends and family, right? Connections and people that we knew, we uh, we know. And some of them have been with us since we've had a viable product. So over two years uh, that have been, that have uh, worked with us, obviously doing the trial. Uh, we have some customers that go for a trial for 30 days. That's what we typically offer for everyone. Uh, some are more comfortable with a, a bit more time uh, through that, and we adapt that that trial period. Uh, really, we're 
again, for us is to reduce the friction and the pressure of, I need to make a change now, what's happening and whatnot. The other part is because uh, through our, our trial, you know, our, our statistics so far is that about 80%, 80 to 90% of the customers that we work with, we do find anomalies. And at least hopefully not all of those are, you know, the starts of, of ransomware attack or espionage or whatnot, but it might be uh, unwanted programs, uh, as Delana was uh, mentioning, uh, crypto miners and, and, and the such. But we need to be deployed and present on different workstations. And sometimes that takes time. That's the other piece that we're, we're learning uh, as we're working with uh, SMB customers is that everyone is so busy that definitely cybersecurity is not top of mind and even taking the time to do a trial. So it's one thing to say you have a 30 day trial and we'd love for that to be done in 30 days, but sometimes we do understand that needs to stretch out to maybe 60 days to, to complete the, uh, the overall assessment. So we are Thank flexible. flexible. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Eric, for the question. We're going to take one very last quick question from Mahdi Dejardin. Yeah, quick, quick question from me is uh, special. So um, one, Elana, um, solid, polished, poised pitch. It was uh, uh, extremely solid, um, a very good pitch. So um, my, my, my question was, um, towards the, the the scalability of the model uh elana mm -hmm. you mentioned that the analyst um ratio um is lower so automation would be would be higher what i'm trying to figure out is how how much effort is there to uh, basically connect to all the platforms that you need to connect and then um, um basically um deploy in all the new clients um, how much effort is there and how scalable is it? Thanks, Mehdi. Uh, and, and so to how do we connect to, to the different platforms? So today we support Windows and Mac. It is an agent-based so solution and, and service. So it's all about getting the license key, the registration key um, for the customers and the piece of software. They can use their uh, preferred deployment solution to, to get the technology on those different devices and or you know very small organization they can just do the installation we literally have a video on our on our channel that shows the installation takes a minute to to get done um, the way it was built as well to reconnect to our cloud service uh, we are working in in Azure it's outbound communication only our agent initiates all communications with us so our customers don't have to think about uh, the network and firewall ports and communications and what are those all of those parameters if you can have access if you have access to the internet you can access you know a secure website uh, get technical port 443 it will work and we can even do response capabilities because the agent will check what does it need to respond to and in initiates all of those communications. So the scaling, the, the deployment is rather quick that way. And then quickly to get to how do we scale and how do we support, it, it goes with the whole mindset that we have of computers should be used and there, there are expected outcomes. The way we're using uh, you know, this website today, the way we're using Zoom or anything else, we know how it interacts with computers. Anything that's outside of that, is an anomaly and we should be investigating those. And that's exactly what we do. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much, Steve. Mehdi, thank you very much for the question as well to all of our judges. Well done, Ilana and Steve as well for the pitch and for the Q&A. Uh, we're seeing some really great engagement on the chat as well. So thank you guys very much and good luck with the rest of the process. All right, everyone, just a very quick reminder for those of you guys who are asking questions to our teams on the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have a portion where you guys can directly ask your questions to them or we ask your questions on your behalf. But we do have a networking component coming up later. So make sure you stick around and save those questions. Or like we said, please engage directly with them, whether connecting with them on LinkedIn or through um, the information that we're sharing as well. And like I said, don't forget, we will give you an opportunity to ask any questions you guys have through the networking portion. All right, guys, we are now down to the final two teams. I am really excited to invite onto the stage the founder and CEO of Kinetics, David Leher. I'm David, CEO of 
of Conatics. Conatics detects ransomware vulnerabilities. When Invest Quebec and Montreal International recruited Conatics to come to Montreal from New York, we weren't sure. The whole FinTech Accelerator invited us, so we came, and then we stayed. The Ministry of Economy Cybersecurity Program gave us a million dollar plus R&D innovation matching grant, which made us feel even more welcome. Now the Desjardins Challenge provides a chance to prove that our massive, granular, unstructured data, AI approach to cybersecurity monitoring and detection can work as well for ransomware as it does for insider fraud. For us, it's a chance to bring our presence and relationship with Montreal and its leading banks and companies to the next level. Our company started doing AI to work with massive unstructured text from the web. We pivoted to make a bigger impact and realized cybersecurity and ransomware detection is the place to do that. It's the fastest growing cybercrime. Two thirds of all organizations have been targeted and a company is now attacked every 11 seconds. Global costs have gone up almost 60 times in the past six years. Ransomware isn't just a financial risk, but a bankruptcy and national security risk. We realized that two of the top three attack vectors for ransomware could be impacted by our expertise in AI for fast, continuous streaming unstructured data. Those are insider behavior and malware vulnerabilities. We focused on banks and large companies. 90% of computers globally run Microsoft, so we started with that and we'll add other platforms later. For ransomware, we focused on early detection of vulnerabilities. That means not waiting for a mouse to get into your house and then chasing mice. It means plugging every possible mouse hole in your house so no mouse can get in. There are many ways to fight ransomware. The most effective is to prevent any incursion into your network in the first place. And that's where we intervene. A single Windows laptop can contain half a million libraries. It only takes a couple lines of altered code or a binary file in a software library and perfectly functioning software becomes a security hazard overnight. These malicious binaries can sit undetected for years. If you detect some altered binaries, but not all of them, you're leaving holes open in your network and a single hole unplugged can compromise your entire company. Existing tools don't delve down into abstract syntax trees in your software code or check line by line instructions for alterations. A single line of altered code in a binary can still damage your entire system while flying under the radar of your antivirus software. Some competitors do succeed at detecting some types of altered binaries while struggling with others. That's why Conatics takes a multi pronged, triple filter approach to malware vulnerability detection. All three Conatics approaches have been studied by scientists, meaning it's a technically challenging problem and no single approach can fully resolve it. If one of our three approaches fails to detect altered binaries, the other two likely will. In addition to our own spin on traditional signature-based approaches of fingerprinting and digital certificates, we build on recent improvements to neural networks for byte weight comparison by researchers at Carnegie Mellon and Berkeley bringing new innovation and sophistication to the game. Our detector works on any system without integration required. A small agent is installed on each endpoint. After the initial audit, it only runs when scanned libraries update. It runs on premise, but updates the local model from the cloud daily. You need to detect as many vulnerabilities as you can, but you don't want to manage multiple tools. You want one tool that decompiles to the most granular level granular level that's the most thorough, that applies multiple fine-grained filters, and that detects the most vulnerabilities in your network. Any segment of the global cybersecurity market, as we know, that impacts ransomware detection or prevention is multi-billions with a compound annual growth rate of 15% or higher. But that's not why we do this. We do this for a safer and more secure world. We have relationships with leading resellers of cybersecurity software to corporate clients. Channel partners and smaller managed service providers can help us sell to large banks and companies. The tool is priced per endpoint for both large and small organizations. The Conatics team has won numerous international innovation awards for our work together. We pioneered AI for cybersecurity monitoring and detection, first for insider fraud, now for ransomware. We got high marks from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and the U.K. government recently named us one of the most innovative cybersec startups in the U.K. We've won major challenges and awards from Citibank, IBM, and others for our innovative technology. Desjardins Mentoring will improve our product and help us bring it to market faster. 
Desjardins network and resources will help us continue to build our relationships with leading banks and companies in Quebec. Desjardins can help us to raise investment to match and be doubled by our government innovation grant. Fonatics finds vulnerabilities in software that others don't, so ransomware can't get in. Thank you. Amazing, David. Well done. And on behalf of everybody, I'll give you a round of applause. We do have some questions lined up for you, but I'm going to quickly bring on um, your teammate from the tech team, Santosh, onto the screen as well. Welcome, Santosh. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. We're going to start with Laviva from Luge Capital. So I'm going to bring her up on the stage. Hey, David. Great to Hello. see you here. Uh, Looks like we have a bit of technical difficulties, so I apologize for that, David and Santosh. We'll come back to Laviva when everything is good on her end. In the meanwhile, I'm going to bring on Sumit. Hey, David. Hi, Santosh. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Um, question for you. In, in your materials, you talked a little bit about uh, a lot of banks currently have in-house solutions that they've deployed. Can you talk a little bit about what the adoption life cycle uh, for your product looks like from a bank's perspective, especially in an environment that may be using a combination of new and legacy systems? Well, we, we made it uh, as simple to install as possible. So you only need to install it on endpoints. And, uh, you know, basically we plan to do uh, pilots and, and test it. We were just now at the testing stage. We're finishing the prototype. So I can't tell you from experience, but I can tell you that we plan to uh, have them test it. And then they can adopt it as they like, endpoint by endpoint. So they could put it on a smaller scale and pilot it, and then they can expand. Um, but it's it's not intrusive. And they can keep their other tools too. We don't mind. <laughs> Thanks, David. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sumi, for the question. We're gonna try one more time with Laviva. Hopefully the everything is solved there. How's it? Can you hear me clearly, Laviva? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, perfect. I'm gonna give you this floor now. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so I basically wanted to just understand the competitive landscape and how you guys are differentiating in your sales pitch. We detect all the vulnerabilities. We detect more than others do, and you need to detect as many as possible. It's as simply as that. If you leave one hole unplugged, you're in trouble. You need the most thorough tool available. And because we have a triple filter and we use AI in a more innovative way than others, we're going to detect more openings, more holes, in your network than others, and that's what you need. So no other tool or combination, maybe all of them in combination, but maybe not because they don't use as sophisticated an approach. So um, so we're going to detect more vulnerabilities. Thank you. Perfect, amazing. Thank you very much, Laviva, for the question. And second time to trauma, apparently. Okay, we have one more question from Sarah from Startup in Residence, David. And the question is as follows. Uh, where is your data coming from? You speak of libraries of binary files. Where do you get these and how do you make sure they are thorough and up to date? Uh, we have our own databases, but uh, uh, Santosh, do you want to answer? Yeah, so we use the standard Windows uh, system where we extract the half million records and we extract each binary files, including their execution logic. That makes a difference. The execution lo logic, not just a program, the execution logic and we keep against our each files in the windows in our database. So that's our main database. That will be a legitimate windows file database. That's how we check whether the data is genuine or not. Yes. And again, right. eventually we'll expand to other platforms as well. And yes. Those. Perfect. Well, David Santosh, thank you guys very, very much. Well done on the pitch. Well done on the answers. Good luck with the rest of the process. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, guys, I hope you're still feeling good, still have the same energy from when we first started. We have one more team left to go. And without further ado, I'm going to bring on Owen Wang, the co-founder and business lead of BData. Thank you, Lyle. Aventech is a renowned equipment manufacturer specialized in gateway and uh, end of, uh, a point of sale device. The company was hit by a ransomware in November 2020. Aventech had to pay over $14 million in ransom to avoid the data 
from being released to the public. What happened to Eventec was not an anomaly. In fact, in March this year, Acer had to pay $50 million in ransom, and the Colonial Pipeline had to pay $5 million in ransom. And the incident also triggered an oil shortage across the United States. The trend is very clear. We're seeing an unprecedented increase in the severity and frequency of cyber attacks. It is estimated that in 2020, $1 trillion of damage was done by cyber attack worldwide. Now, BData has the solution to stop that trend. My name is Owen Wei. I'm the co-founder at BData. Using blockchain technology, BData has created a cybersecurity software for IoT, point of sales, and edge device. Our protocol protects data transactions, including point of sale device to server data transaction, machine to machine communication, and data in data management. Our software is called BIoT technology, which stands for Blockchain for IoT technology. The software can be installed on resource limited devices. And this is how it works. Upon successful installations, the device information will be added to our blockchain. The ledger keeps the device parameter immutable to changes and distribute the registration information across all the nodes on the ledger. Any unauthorized changes to the digital or physical status of the machine will be rejected by our blockchain. What's unique about our technology is that we use multi-chain structure to handle traffic load. And each blockchain handles very specific tasks, such as authentication, device device monitoring, and uh, device control. BIoT technology has a wide application across multiple industries. For example, in payment industry, our technology can be deployed on payment machine to protect buyer and seller information. The technology can be used to protect manufacturer by protecting their machinery and equipment. The technology also provides a traceable and transparent supply chain. In energy sector, our BIoT technology can be used to protect on-premise equipment, such as power grid and pipeline. We run a very standard subscription-based business model. For each BIoT license, we charge $15 per month, and it is very typical for an average customer to purchase over 200 licenses for a project. Now, coming back to the story, later in 2020, we were approached by Eventech to deploy our technology on their product to help them and their customer to defend against future ransom attacks. That's how we got our first key customer and also partner. Now, we're also partnering with Intel, Asus, Supermicro, and Amgrid. We have estimated that our technology will save these companies millions in ransom and operation loss due to cyber attacks. The market, uh, the market opportunity is tremendous. According to IBS research, the market size of the cybersecurity worldwide is around $100 billion. North America accounts for $40 billion, and we estimated the total addressable market for BData is $16 billion. And our first small achievable goal is to reach $1 million sales in target uh, in 2022. To achieve our long-term goal, we have laid out specific milestones to help us get there. For example, this is our customer acquisition plan. We already have several key customers in our pipeline, including Amgrid, uh, Adventech, Asus, and uh, uh, Supermicro. And now we're targeting potential customers such as Desjardins, TD Banks, Vimo, Acer, and Gigabyte. We are a team of professional engineers with average of 15 years of work experience. Our advisors are industry experts and executives from publicly traded companies. We are currently looking for funding to help us grow in terms of sales and marketing. And we're looking for, uh, for pilot projects to help us showcase our technology. We have gained quite a bit of traction. We have won several awards, including Rogers 5G competitions, first place, um, Lion Slayer, second place, and uh, we're a winner of Ericsson uh, Encore 5G program. And there's many more. Now, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank you for watching and we're open to any questions. Wonderful, well done, Owen, great pitch. You can relax now, the pitches are done for you guys. Uh, I'm gonna bring up uh, Sayed Bari, who is your co-founder and CEO of the company. How are you doing today, Sayed? Thank you very much.
Perfect. All right. I'm going to open up the floor to questions and we're going to start off with Paula from Desjardins. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, are you focusing only on securing IoT communication or do you want to do securing all communication in a network for all devices like endpoints, servers, et cetera? Yeah. So um, our technology is basically um, architecture agnostic and operating system agnostic. So we have deployed our technology on uh, microprocessors, even on SIM card for the use case that we did for the TELUS. And uh, so uh, we we are basically, we have a very big market, but the but the way we are going to, uh, to, uh, to acquire the market is basically working through the device partnership and deploy our technology on the device. And as many devices as these uh, partners sell, our technology gets uh, sell through that. So our technology get pre-deployed on those devices. We have already launched one Intel uh, Nook, which comes with our device, uh, our technology pre-deployed on it. And uh, companies can buy that uh, through our partners channel. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you very much for the question. I'm gonna bring up Sumit next. I say, Owen, thanks very much for that. Um, just want to better understand your competitive landscape. Um, as I understand, the landscape is quite lean in this space, but there's a couple of global players. Can you talk about some key differentiators uh, for you guys with that product? Yeah, so uh, there are very few com uh, competitors at this moment. Uh, so one of the competition that we have uh, is in the US. Um, and there, they basically only do single chain. So they do only the authentication of the device. We have the multi-chain, which means that we does the device authentication, intrusion detection, monitoring of the device, endpoint management. Uh, so our technology get deployed on the core of the device and it reads the device log. So it provides the complete comprehensive intrusion detection monitoring happening on those devices. So our customers can basically remotely enable or disable the multiple ports on the device. They can uh, manage the firewall settings using our technology. Uh, and and the, our competitors are not there. They just provide only the device authentication uh, portion. And to add on to that, um, that's from technical uh, perspective. And from the business perspective, we have a strategic director from uh, Singapore and they're helping us grow in the uh, Southeast Asian region. Um, we have a few um, key projects from uh, Singapore and Bangladesh. So that's uh, another way we, uh, can, uh, we can help compete our competitors. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Aisha. No problem. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sumit, for the question. We have one more question from the Startup and Residence team, Omen and Seed, and that is, in the next six months, what do you imagine your biggest challenge is going to be? I think um, the next six months, uh, our biggest challenge is to get more customers and uh, get more, uh, you know, uh, partners aligned with our technology. Uh, we understand that it's, it's a new approach that we are taking, and uh, that's that's we need to promote through and uh, get people excited about and use our technology. All right, perfect. Well, ONC, with that, those are the questions we have for you from our judges. Thank you very much for your pitch. Thank you very much for your responses. And we wish you the best of luck with the rest of the process. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. I'd like to take a moment to congratulate all five of our finalists. As you guys can imagine, this is not an easy process to go through, pitching live, having your Q&As, but they've all done a phenomenal job. And I'm looking at the chat and seeing that you guys mostly all agree with me. So I'm really happy to see that. I'd love to also take a second and let the let you guys know what's going to be coming up next. But before we do that, I would like to invite our judges at this moment to please proceed into the deliberation room. Um, and if you have any challenge with that, please just note it down on the chat and we'll be able to better direct you. As the judges leave and go into the deliberation room, it does not mean that everything is over for you guys. We're going to give you a little bit of a break. You maybe grab a drink, um, check in on your pet maybe do a quick bio break, but then we're going to get started with our special guest, Fire Fireside Chat. Um, 
conducted by our, our very own Elvis Wong, and he'll be interviewing Michelle Junot Katsuya. And for those of you who weren't able to hear us in the beginning, he is a phenomenal uh, individual who has extreme extreme extraneous amount of experience in the threat and security assessment space. He's an expert, he's an author, and he's a commentator. He's also worked with the RCMP, as well as the Canadian Security Intelligence Services. You do not want to miss this fireside chat. So grab a drink. We're going to be back shortly. I'm going to hand it over to Elvis very soon as well. And then we'll be back with the final announcements of the winners as well before we conclude for the evening with some networking. Have a wonderful fireside chat, and I'll be with you guys shortly. Welcome back, everybody. Weren't those pitches phenomenal? Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Elvis Wong, the Director of Financial Health here at Fintech Cadence. 
And while the judges are deliberating, I'm honored to moderate a fireside chat with Michelle Juno Katsuya from uh, Michelle Juno Katsuya, our, our guest speaker for today. Michelle has over 38 years of experience as one of Canada's foremost experts in international and national security and intelligence. He began his career at the RCMP before transferring to the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, including leading the Strategic Analysis Unit in Asia Pacific. He's a guest professor at the University of Ottawa in criminology and also co-author of the book, Nest of Spies, the startling truth about foreign agents at work within Canadian borders. I'm really excited for the talk today and everyone, please put your hands together to welcome Michelle. Hi, Michelle, please wel welcome to our events. Hello, Hello everybody. Great. Um, well, today, Michelle, I, I wanted to kick things off. We really wanted to hear about your experience around cybersecurity and really thinking about intelligence. And today we've talked a lot about cybersecurity threats and ransomware, and you've spent your career working in this space. And can you just help us understand a little bit more about the people that are actually behind these attacks and who are they and what their motivations are? Yeah, absolutely. What we need to understand is that with the end of the Cold War in 1990, with the collapse of Soviet Union, we basically moved from a military confrontation to an economic confrontation. Um, at that time, basically, the Internet did not per se exist to the extent that we have it today. And we were not depending on the Internet as much as we are today. So the cloud, all those things were like foreign words. Um, but for uh, intelligence services around the world, it was necessary now to start concentrating on improving national security through an, a healthy economy. So very rapidly, offensive services like the CIA or the former KGB or the Chinese, or et cetera, they uh, focused on trying to steal information, to, to take information away because they realized that it was strategic and gave them sort of a, a healthy national economy. And the internet comes, appears at the end of the 90s. It started to be quite popular, definitely during the, 20, the, 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 the beginning of the 2000 years. Um, and with that came the hackers, came also the people who started to exploit the weakness that existed within the system and the uh, uh, ill-prepared users that we, we, we were all uh, on, on the internet. Rapidly, people started to realize there were not only mischief that could be done, but money that could be done as well. So moving forward, coming to today, we basically realized that there is today basically five threat agents that are existing, that are five categories of, of threat that we need to take attention and pay attention to. Uh, because one of the greatest problems that we have in cybersecurity is very too often people neglect to keep their eyes on the horizon. So before I name those five, I want to spend a moment to talk about this. People don't keep their eyes on the horizon sufficiently. And one of the problems is that in our industry, security is too often perceived as an expense. We do it because we have to do it. And the companies, they don't like to do that. It's an expense. And what is an expense in the private world? It's a sin. The first thing that needs to be cut as much as possible. So we need to be capable to... to to change the discourses. We need to be capable to change the perception that we are an expense to become a strategic investment. To, have a, to be a, a strategic investment, you need to be capable to have a different discourse. You need to be capable to offer value to the C-level of your, of your clients or the company in order to be capable to help them be profitable or succeed uh, uh, in their uh, mission as much as possible. And that is crucial to uh, uh, succeeding in uh, improving our sense as security specialists. So when I'm talking about keeping the eyes on the horizon, we need to sort of identify those five threat agents that will come to you. And I, I'm telling you, they are coming after everybody. So first threat agents will definitely uh, spy-sponsored espionage or state-sponsored espionage. So countries like China, Russia, and even friendly country, because now it's everybody for themselves. 
there's no alignment anymore. Everybody works for their own national security, their own national economy. So state sponsored, where you have literally units, uh, army or, or others that are hired to work full time in trying to uh, 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 steal information from, from people. And they are very, very, very successful. And the, it is a very, very big uh, 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 budget and a big uh, uh, industry, if I may say. The second one will be industry against industry, companies against company. Do not underestimate how much money some companies can uh, devote to all this. Just to give you an example, uh, a few years ago, Siemens, one of the largest uh, German company in, in, in the world, was caught with a slush fund in the Luxembourg uh, banks. Uh, the slush fund was $2.4 billion, it's a B, 2.4 billion euro. 2.4 billion euro, that's bigger than the CSIS budget, by the way, uh, annual budget. And that the slush fund was strictly used for bribe and spy activities, stealing information as much as possible. So company against company, and we see it, we saw it here. We saw Air Canada against uh, 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 WestJet or vice versa. We saw uh, CNCP, uh, Canadian National Rail, uh, uh, be involved. There's many companies that get caught recently, even within the Canadian borders. The third one will be organized crime. Organized crime is definitely interested into stealing information, ransoming people, because it is money. The fourth one, is a growing force and is a growing present. And here I want to spend a, a moment talking about this because this is going to be a reckoning force to uh, deal with, which is activism. Activism, they don't have the same mission as stealing information for money. They want to hurt you for an ideological purpose and they definitely will uh, cause you to lose money if you're not prepared. Why do we have to pay a little bit more attention uh, to this? It's because with the uh, uh, recent the last 20, 30 years, we've seen uh, uh, populist uh, uh, leaders starting to emerge. And with the venue of uh, the uh, um, uh, social media, we started to see a polarization of uh, interest group starting to appear. With this polarization, with people starting to sort of identify their own cluster of, of, of group, we've started to see as well uh, uh, a, a, an erosion of the decorum, what I refer to as the decorum that used to exist within the society. We were capable before to have a conversation, to have a critique, to have a debate without having people sending insults or threat or, 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 or even literally physically uh, uh, going after you. Now we have cyber bullies, we have all sort of intimidation that is taking place, and we're going to take more and more of this and see more and more of this. And if you didn't notice, in the last uh, uh, federal election, our federal uh, parties have difficulties now to rally people. They have difficulties to sort of gather people because this polarization is taking place. If you had also uh, uh, to this emotional uh, issues like the COVID has provoked, you're going to have some people that unfortunately might want to take the matter in their own hands and start doing things. So this will definitely bring more activism People will go online and will try to do attack against private industry, against government agencies, against municipalities, provincial, federal, name it. Nobody will be protected and, 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 and the, the ability of, of the discourses will be worse and bad. Now, linked to that is the fifth threat agents that we've got to be really, really careful. And it's basically the wolf in the barn. It's the, uh, the inside job, the inside uh, 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 threat that comes from either unconscious employees, unaware employees, or malicious employees, or, 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 or uh, 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 contractors that we, we, we brought in, or people that we consultant that we brought in that see the potential of, of arming you or, or stealing information, or simply because by simple naivety will uh, sort of... Uh, uh, release information or get access or open a file they were not supposed to. So in that field, we need to be much, much more aware. We need to uh, bring awareness at the top level 
we need to sort of repeat the messages. Yeah, it might sound boring and everything, but you need to do it. If you don't do it, you need to do, for example, particularly for employees working in very sensitive area, you need to do a background check uh, uh, and a security clearance at minimum every five years. You know, life change. Uh, somebody you hired 28 years old coming out of university, stellar background and everything, at 35 might be totally different, devastated by a, a bad divorce or, or having developed a, 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 a dependency or, or a, to, to gaming or something like this. And now suddenly we have a totally different employees. But it's not because you did a background check when they came in that you have the same individual at that point. And if you don't do that on a regular basis, you might get cut uh, uh, and, 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 and pay a dear, dear, dear price. Right. It's obviously much more and deeper than that, a much bigger problem. So from your perspective then, as Canada, what do we, we what should we be prioritizing to protect from these big cyber threats, both from a national level, but also from a business level? Well, one of the problem and one of the my 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 grievance with the government is that we do not have enough steward, stewardship and leadership coming from the government giving us warning about this. You know, we have people like you and I coming from the private sector trying to warn the people, trying to constantly go to <clears throat> to the general public, but they don't really pay attention. They don't really listen to 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 this because the government doesn't talk about it. So speak no evil, see no evil. And so for us, it's an uphill battle constantly to try to convince people. On top of that, there is a false sense of security to a certain extent, you know, with like, for example, and please don't throw me any rocks, compliance. Well, compliance, guys, it's yesterday's problem. It's not what is coming up. It's nice. We need it. We want it. And, and, and it's, it's a starting point. But don't stop there. And that's why I'm talking about keep your eyes on the horizon. If you're not capable to foresee what is coming up threat-wise, risk-wise, you're not doing your job. And I don't need your masturbation. I don't need your intellectual masturbation telling me that, oh, I know what I'm doing. I know. No, no. I need you to tell me exactly what I need to face. For that, you need to perform a good threat and risk assessment in your, in, in your organization. How do you perform a good threat and risk assessment? Well, basically, there's a small formula that I've always employed that the C-levels understand very, very quickly. You know, threat to plus threat from equal vulnerability assessment. Easy. Threat to plus threat from equal vulnerability assessment. Threat to, what do you need to protect? Where are my family jewels that I need to protect in my organization? Now, 90% of, of, of security specialists with a little bit of experience, a little bit of brain activity will be capable to give you a decent assessment. You know, it's common sense. The problem is the second part, the threat from. 90% of the security world is not capable to give you a threat from because they're not trained to do the intelligence assessment that needs to be done in order to find out where the threat is coming. I might have something that is extremely important for me, but nobody cares. But there's something that I don't necessarily consider that important, but somebody cares for. We need to be able to assess that. And it's amazing to see some companies spending money. It's, it's amazing. There's a, a, a case I worked on many years ago with Hydro-Quebec. Hydro-Quebec was, you might recall, had a, a journalist that went on one of their electrical dam and filmed with the cameraman and said, you see, if I was a terrorist, I could have blown that place up. Well, yeah, you could have used an explosive to blow that place up and probably you would have sort of uh, throw a, a blackout for a, a one day or two, but that's it, that's all. An, a, an electrical dam, you need a mini nuclear bomb to explode something of that nature. It was wrong. But Hydro-Quebec spent $139 million, $139 million resecuring their entire system. When I went in and I told them this was a fake, fake threat, um, I assessed through my, my little methodology and I found out that Five sabotage uh, uh, activities took place the year before. Three committed by inside employees. It cost to it cost to Hydro Quebec one hundred and ninety million dollar. Those five sabotage wow. incidents. 
and nothing has been done about it. Find the mistakes. You got a fake problem, then you spend 139. You got the real problem, 190, almost 200, and nobody does anything. That's why the threat and risk assessment is so, so, so important. So and when you can do this, when you go to your client and you're capable to talk like this and you're capable to help them assess, now you become useful. If you just got a product to sell, if you just got a service to sell and say, please buy me because I'm the best on the market and stuff like that, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. Everybody has the best product. Everybody has the best solutions to offer. You have to be capable to bring a plus value, to contribute to the assessment the, 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 the client needs to perform in order to understand where you fit. And more importantly, what is the strategic value that you bring to the company? Because you need to be in the chain of value. If you're not there, you're no go. So threat to and threat from, that's, that's super insightful. And one of the takeaways from this uh, fireside chat so far um, I think this is where you're leading is actually a really good point because we had our pitches today. Uh, there were great solutions. Uh, they did. I remember one of the pitches mentioned how uh, it's not really that competitive because 98% of businesses still don't have any cybersecurity, cyber, like they're not using these solutions, right? So how do you actually suggest and like, do you have any advice for these startup founders to actually get it to become a strategic, uh, strategic party for these clients and businesses that they're selling to get to know exactly what your client needs to know you know there's a difference between what is nice to know it's and the difference between what is needed to know what you must know um and for that i will give you a little int you know we use that in the field of intelligence and when i have my intelligence analysts writing report to me i need them to know the difference between a topic and an issue. What is the difference between a topic and an issue? One word, consequences. The mm. consequences are linked to the issue, not necessarily to the topic. The topic is nice to know. The issue, you must know. The sole purpose of intelligence is to become, uh, 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 to, to empower decision makers. The sole purpose of intelligence is to empower decision makers. You need to provide intelligence in your assessment. Assess intelligence is what? It's information plus analysis equal intelligence. You do not collect intelligence. You produce intelligence. And you must become an intelligence officer. You must sort of play that role and come to your client and listen to what are their preoccupation. What is their concern? Listen to, to, to what they bring to you. See if their consequences are, are, are real. Because basically, there's three types of threat. There's the real threat something that really exists. There's the projected threat, something that comes from something real that we think might affect us and will come to us. And there's the imaginary threat. And believe me, in our industry, there's a lot of Im imagination and there's a lot of fear mongers and people who try to sort of get, just to come and try to scare the, 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 the client, it's not good enough. If you sort of bring, again, plus value in your discourse and you explain and you understand their, 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 their challenges, you will have a different discourse and you will have their time and their attention. This has been super insightful, Michelle. As a last question, uh, how about us as individuals? Do you have any advice for us in our daily lives on how we should better secure our own information against these online threats? Well, first and above all, I, to my point of view, Protect your personal information. Protect your personal information. Constantly, we are asked to bring on and to give all sort of information. Uh, uh, we have all sort of people that are starting to be awake of that, and they're bringing you know double identification, blah blah blah. But nevertheless, if you can avoid giving your real information, try not to give your information. Like for example, uh, if you registered on on Facebook or whatsoever, they ask for your your date of birth. Don't give your date of birth. Damn it. Give something else. Who cares your date of birth of everything? Every year I get uh, in the month of July, tons of happy birthday, Michelle. My birthday is not in July, by the way. So, but hey, my friends were there and I can recognize who's my friend who's not still. <laughs> you know? Be careful with that. The other element, definitely, if it is suspicious, 
do not open that. Investigate. If something is unusual, you receive something, it's, it's unusual, investigate a little bit more. Go online, the, double check the phone number, or or if, if something looks, and they're really crafty. They're really, really, really good. Uh, if they send you something that looks like maybe your bank, call your bank and say, did you send me this? Confirm and stuff like this. Um, most of us in the field of uh, cybersecurity have developed those kind of reflex. We need to promote this and we need to talk to people, your mother, your father, your, your friends, etc. because not everybody, and unfortunately, like I said, the government is doing a poor job in raising awareness. We need awareness. That's the only successful defense that we have because when you have, you're in, you're, you're, you got caught, there's not a lawyer in the world. There's no police officer. There's no security, security, uh, cybersecurity person that can get back what was taken away from you or the access you gave. And I could, I could go on if you pay the beer. I'm going to go all night to sort of uh, 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 tell you tons of stories, tons of stories, very, very crafted stories. And for example, 2010, the uh, Treasury Board of Canada, federal government, you know, high security, blah, 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 got caught because the Chinese hackers were able to go through a law firm in order to get into the federal government. To this day, they don't know how much penetration and where the people went wow. because it was too late when they got they got caught. Uh, we got another case where we, uh, a case I worked on, and an army a guy, in national defense, Monday morning comes in, he receive a, an email from apparently a colleague from national defense that says, uh, hey, listen, uh, my daughter was playing soccer against your, your daughter this weekend. Too bad you lost. Maybe next time your team will do better. By the way, could you send me the report? Ta, ta, ta. And the guy clicked. He said, whoa, 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 I'm not supposed to send. So he went to his commanding officer and said, can I send this report? No, no, no. Who's that moron asking for that? They started investigating. They found out that it was a Chinese uh, uh, IP address that uh, sent that thing. How they found out about the soccer game, which his daughter really played? Facebook. How they found out about the guy to send the email? LinkedIn. Uh, and by the way, note, note to everybody, when your employees have a very, very extended and detailed uh, LinkedIn uh, message, they're probably looking for another job. So uh, be careful. <laughs> no, that's wild. And but no, so on that note, two pieces of advice, protect your information and do not open something that you are not expecting. Absolutely. Um, we, yeah, Michelle, we, uh, those 20 minutes have actually gone by so quickly. So interesting. Uh, if you do have the time, I'm sure everybody would love to hear more of your stories. We have networking at 6 p.m. If you want to join, uh, I'm sure everybody would love love to chat with you and hear some I of your stories. I shall story. return. <laughs> Great. Thank you again, Michelle, for taking the time to, to share with us today. It's uh, super valuable and super insightful. Uh, Thank for you for the invitation and good luck to all the uh, competitors. Great. Great. Now, uh, as the judges are finalizing their deliberations, I do want to share a, a couple of events that are happening in the ecosystem uh, over the next little while for uh, everyone to sign in, sign up for. Uh, so next week is actually the Canadian uh, Canada, Canada FinTech Forum. So it's happening from October 27th to 29th, um, and it's 100% virtual pre presented by uh, Portage Ventures. So we do have uh, some extra tickets available for the FinTech Cadence Network. So if you are interested, uh, please send us a note. Um, there's going to be FinTech Cadence members in the chat, uh, so you can communicate us communicate with them there. Secondly, uh, if you enjoyed the pitches today, we have another demo day coming up in two weeks on November 4th. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart because this is the program that I run, uh, the IFH Lab. So over the past six months, we've been working with eight startups from four provinces across Canada that are focused on improving the financial lives of Canadians, uh, particularly those more financially vulnerable. They'll be showcasing their solutions on November 4th, uh, and you'll see the registration link in the chat as well. We also have our FinTech end of the year review day happening on November 16th. Uh, for the First time since COVID, we're actually going back in person for FinTech Drinks. Uh, so we're going to be inviting a couple of amazing speakers 
to talk about what happened in fintech this past year here in Canada. So it's going to be hybrid. It's going to be both in person in Montreal plus virtual as well. Uh, and you'll be able to see details shortly and the registration as well in the chat. Finally, uh, at the same time, our fintech drinks will be happening as part of the Holt Exchange Roaring Fintech Show. Holt has been a very close partner of ours over the past couple of years, and they're also doing a hybrid event uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern on uh, Tuesday, November 16th, where you'll get to see uh, what's been happening with Holt over the past year. So thank you everyone for the time. Uh, we are going to have a mini break. Welcome back DJ Sinka before the judges are ready for their announcements. Uh, and thanks everyone. Uh, and hope you enjoy the rest of the show.
Welcome back. You get to see me again. I hope you guys had a really wonderful time. Well, not only one enjoying the music. Actually, I should probably say a big thank you to DJ Cinco, who's been providing the music around here. Uh, but I also heard that you guys had a phenomenal uh, fireside chat with um, Michelle and Elvis. I can't wait to look for the recording and hear what I have missed. Just a note as well for everybody, if you did miss any of the pitches or if you missed the fireside chat, then we will be uploading this video shortly. So be on the lookout for that. The best way to track it is to follow us on YouTube. That's right. Fintech Cadence has a YouTube channel. So follow us there so that you're able to get all of the information. On our side, we had a very heated, very interesting judges deliberation. Um, we did decide who the top three are. So I am going to very uh, warmly welcome onto the stage Pona from Desjardins, who's going to be joining me as we announce the top three winners. <laughs> Hello, Pona. Hi, Laya. How are you? <laughs> Fine. It was a tough choice. It was. It really was. I have to say and commend all the five startups. I know that wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for the judges to pick from you. Um, and I know, Pona, for, for you and I going through that deliberation, uh, it was interesting. It was challenging, but we got to the final three. Perfect. So without further ado, for the audience, I hope you guys are ready for the startups. I hope you guys are ready and excited. We're going to start with the third place, go all the way to the first place. Just a reminder of the prizes again. Third place wins $5,000 cash prize and entry into Fintech Cadence. Second place wins $15,000 non-dilutive cash entry into the startup and residence program, as well as potential investment of up to $250,000. And the same thing for the first place prize, except it's a little bit more money with $25,000. So without further ado, I have the pleasure to introduce the third place prize and the third place team for the Desjardins Cybersecurity Finalist Challenge, put a bit of a drum roll, is SciDev. Congratulations, Ilana and Steve. Hello, Steve. Hello, Ilana. Thank you very much. Yes, congratulations Hi. on third place. Thank you. Yes, how are you guys feeling? Mentally exhausted, but really happy to be participating. <laughs> and, and some some great technologies that the team was listening to the, the pitches. Stiff competition and congratulations to everybody. Absolutely wonderful. And sorry, Steve, did you want to jump in? I was going to say the same thing. Great technology, great pitches. I'm happy I wasn't one of the judges. So it, it... <laughs> I'm pretty sure I, we would agree with that. But thank you guys very much. Congratulations on third place prize and we will be in touch very shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Pola, for second place and first place, I'll hand the mic over to you to make the announcement. Yeah, so uh, second place was a tough choice too. It was for B Data. Hello. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you, Lyle. We're very happy to be here. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to say, like, thank you, Fintech uh, Caden, for hosting this uh, competition. It's uh, very important to nurture uh, competitions and uh, uh, startup in, in Canada. Just, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I think it was a very competitive competition, so I really appreciate that you got selected. <laughs> Absolutely. So say and, uh, what are you looking forward to the future with uh, 
Yeah, we are looking forward to work with Des Jordan to basically first we want to demo a technology show that what we have developed. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be very fast deployment to show that how we can scale up in partnership with Des Jordan. That's really important to take over technology in the fintech region. Absolutely. Well, Owen and Saeed, thank you guys so much. Congratulations again on second place prize. We'll be in touch shortly. Desjardins will be in touch shortly. Enjoy the rest of your evening and your well-earned prize. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Take care. Perfect. Pola, let's hear first place prize. <laughs> <laughs> so the first place is for... If... <laughs> <laughs> Well, hello, Jonathan and Samuel. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is amazing. Thank you very hey, much. Can I, I understand you're paying for the after work with all this money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And that was extremely, extremely pleasant. And I would say fun to do that experience with Fenton Cadence and, and all the old team, the judge, everybody was so neat. Thank you very much, everybody. That was amazing. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the organization and really looking forward to what's coming up. Uh, super happy. This means a lot to us and uh, we're looking, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to work with all of you guys. Amazing, guys. Jonathan, Samuel, congratulations on a uh, first place on a very, very tough competition. Great job with all the work that you're doing. The judges were incredibly impressed. I speak on behalf of all of them to say that you guys uh, earned where you guys are. So congratulations. Thank you very much. And I just want to add as well that every every participant have been amazing. And I will definitely contact all of them because I see them on, on the first place, every single one of them. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you. thanks to our team as well. Team effort as always. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations, Jonathan. Congratulations, Samuel. Congratulations for the to the full faith team. Paula, I will thank you as well for all of your time, for the tough deliberation and for the announcements, and uh, we'll be seeing you shortly. Thank you, and I want to, to thank all of our five finalist startups uh, who participated to this challenge. This is really awesome to see Canadian companies like all of them who want to help the community, people to facing cybersecurity challenge. So thank you all, and thank you, uh, Lyle, for the organization. Absolutely. It's our absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. We're almost done. Stick around for two more minutes as we quickly wrap up. As Pona said, we want to thank all the five finalists. It was not an easy selection. You guys did a phenomenal job and you made the judges job very, very difficult. But congratulations to Faith, Cyber Defense, AI, SciDef, Kinetics, and Data. You guys are doing some phenomenal work and we're happy to give you any platform or any visibility that we can. I do want to send a quick reminder again. I know I've said it a couple of times, but I think it's really key for any of our audience listening. If there is anything you can do to support these startups in any shape or form, remember network, mentorship, industry access, or capital, please reach out to them directly. We've been sharing their information on LinkedIn. Look for their website. Stay informed of what they're doing. The only way a startup ecosystem works is when the whole community pulls together and provides access where possible. So please make sure that you guys do that. Take the time to support these teams. And as well, don't forget, there is a full roster of 16 other teams that are trying to tackle cybersecurity issues in Canada. So make sure you also take some time to check them out. I also very quickly want to thank the judges. I think ad nauseum at this point, we've said how difficult of a job they've had. Um, but I do want to say... Thank you guys for all the difficult conversations, for the final decisions, and for spending your evening with us here today. Lastly, before you guys leave, we have fintech events coming up for the next two months that are going to be exciting. I mean, how much more exciting can it get than fintech all day, every day? So just a quick reminder at the events that are coming up. We do have the fintech forum happening next week. It is 100% virtual. Um, it's going to be incredible, exciting conversations and really cool content that they've been working very, very hard to do. If you are a startup in our ecosystem that have gone through any of our programs, we do have free tickets. So please make sure you reach out to us. We'll send you the links to reach out to us on uh, Slack, 
excuse me, on the chat really quickly there. I'm getting my platforms confused. You have to excuse me. So make sure that you guys connect with us if you're a startup that has gone through any of our programs and we can provide you with some free tickets for the FinTech Forum. As well, if you had fun today, you're going to have fun again on November 4th. We have a final demo day coming up for the Innovate Financial Health Lab. Four provinces, eight startups, all focusing on one thing, and that is improving the financial lives of Canadians. You do not want to miss this demo day. It's going to be incredibly exciting. And then last, partially last but not least, we're coming in person. We're going to have a chance to hang out again together physically. We had to wait two years to do it, but now we're back. Uh, we will have our final FinTech drinks of the year in person in Montreal. For those of you who are not in the city or for those of you who cannot attend, don't worry, it will be a hybrid event, so you can follow the content, you can follow the phenomenal speakers we have lined up uh, online as well, but make sure you register for that. And this year, we're excited to do our final FinTech drinks in partnership with Holt Accelerator. So make sure you also check out their uh, event coming up, the Roaring FinTech Show, taking place on the same day as the FinTech drinks, one after the other. So you do not have to compete to which FinTech event you want to go to. You get to go to all of them. With that being said, everybody, thank you so much for spending your evening with us, a wonderful Thursday with us, listening to some cybersecurity startups. Doesn't get more exciting than this, if you ask me. I will thank you guys again one more time. Thank you to the startup and residence team, Eric, Sarah, Niv. You guys have been phenomenal. I also want to thank our FinTech Cadence team that's been working really hard in the background. Gigi, Marina, Karina, Elvis, Molly, and Nina. Thank you guys very, very much. And to the full Desjardins team, thank you guys for allowing these kind of experiences to happen. And last but not least, thank you very much to our startups for pitching and participating in this. To our audience, have a wonderful evening. If you want to network, don't go anywhere. We're going to be opening up the networking right now. Make sure you get a chance to talk to other people, talk to the startups now that you've seen the results. And we hope to see you shortly. As you can see, lots of fintech events coming up in person, if not virtually. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and good night.